Good evening. On behalf of the Newark Public Library, I welcome you to the opening of Newark's History Keepers, 70 Years of the New Jersey Room. I'm Tom Ankner. Uh, that was something new. Uh, Newark's <laughs> History Keepers is an exhibit that will be on display on the third floor of Main Library until next spring. It marks the 70th anniversary of the uh, room now, of the department now known as the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center. Uh, I am I'm joined tonight by my two co-curators, Beth Zach Cohen and Gregory Guderian. We will discuss the exhibit, the history of the department, and the important work we do each day documenting the lives of the people in Newark and New Jersey. We will be sharing some images from the exhibit with you tonight. Uh, uh, we will be sharing some images uh, from the exhibit with you tonight. We also have a short video to share, and we welcome any questions and comments you have. Please type these comments in the <laughs> chat box. We will get to as many as possible toward the end of our program. Uh, so now, to begin, we will be showing a short video I took part in back in February. I conducted a video tour of the library for a film crew from Rutgers, for a class taught by, um, uh, by um, Anne, I can't remember her last name. Part of the video included some samples from the collections of the New Jersey room. It runs about six minutes. And here it is. I just have to share my, begin sharing my screen now. Minute. So this is the New Jersey Room, uh, formerly the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center, which is the local history room of the Newark Public Library. We've been collecting materials having to do with New Jersey since the library was established in the 1880s. It became a separate department here in uh, 1951, and we're actually planning to uh, do a, an exhibit on the uh, 70th anniversary of the room, which will be out on the third floor gallery later this year. I just want to show you some of the materials we've collected over the years. Um, first of all, I want to talk about the photo collection. We have a very large photo collection here of several hundred thousand images. We house the photo archives of both the Star Ledger and the Newark Evening News, a newspaper that um, folded in the early 70s. Uh, we have, some, and I just want to show you a few pictures here. We have some pictures of Broad and Market, a uh, big um, a, an intersection in the middle of the city. This is from 1929, I believe. That's uh, an image of um, Broad and Market from 1929. And this is from the same spot of about 30 years later, 1956. Oh, I'm sorry, 1953, so about 25 years later. Uh, we, also have some, um, we also have some pictures from the Newark Rebellion. This is one of our, um, the Newark Rebellion of 1967, which is one of our most popular subjects for research. Here are some photos. Uh, so these were photos that appeared in the newspaper or were taken by photo, by news services. Uh, this, is a, this, is, this image is used quite often of National Guardsmen standing on a street in Newark after dark with their guns drawn. Uh, this is another photo that um, we've used a few, that's been used by researchers a few times of uh, um, officers um, with two men against a wall. And this is um, uh, a photo of some looting that took place during the rebellion. Uh, it's a dark history in the uh, dark period in the city's history, but it's a, something that we get asked about a lot. So I wanted to show you some pictures from that. We also have a large uh, postcard collection. We have a number of color postcards from um, mostly, I think, from the, the early 20th century. This is the um, this is City Hall, New York City Hall. This is uh, the county courthouse. We have a couple of pictures from Branchbrook Park right here and right there. And then we also have, of course, a big collection of images of the Newark Public Library. Uh, we have a large book collection here. One of the most popular types of books that get asked for are the city directories. Uh, Newark has, and this is one, this is the earliest city directory we have. This is from 1835. This is um, an alphabetical listing of people who lived in the city at that time. Um, so this is, uh, this is from 1835. We have these up until 1964 when they stopped publishing them. But this, these are the Newark city directories. They were like a pre, the city directories were like a precursor to the phone books. It's before everyone had phones in their houses. It's used a lot by genealogists, people uh, researching family who lived in Newark at one time. 
we have, a, we have what we call the information file, what some libraries call the vertical file. We have a, um, it's clippings files, basically. We clip newspapers and we um, uh, keep them in subject, uh, arranged alphabetically by subject. Uh, this is from one of our Newark industry files. This is a, an article from 1948. Uh, the, uh, this is from our historic information file, and anything before about 1970 we call the historic information file. We took the, um, the um, clipping was uh, glued to paper, and these, um, and this is about the, um, this is about the world's largest, I think this is the Wiss Shear Company. It's an article about them from 1948 from the Newark Evening News. Uh, this is something else that also came out of our information file. This is a booklet on the Menin Company, another company that was in Newark, it's a well-known company that was in Newark. It's just a booklet that they published um, on the Menin Company. Uh, we have a series of um, documents from one of our archival collections, our Newark African Americans collection on the a Black Power Conference that took place just days after the Newark Rebellion, actually. It started, I think, on July 20th, 1967, and it was it had planned long before the rebellion occurred. But we have a series of documents, a series of like correspondence and memos and things related to the conference. <laughs> Um, we also have a large newspaper collection. Most of our newspapers are only available on microfilm, uh, but we have a handful of 19th century newspapers available in bound version. This is uh, the Sentinel of Freedom from 1836. We have um, a series of books, um, bound books of the, uh, of the Sentinel of Freedom. Uh, generally, 20th century newspapers are hard to keep in bound form because the quality of the paper that 20th century newspapers were produced on is much poorer than the 19th century paper. Beginning in around 1870, they began using a lot more wood pulp and newsprint. And so the, the, new, the 20th century newspapers actually don't hold up as well as the, the 19th century newspapers. This was, was more rag content in these papers. And it's a little, it's, you know, this is almost 200 years old and it's uh, still in actually pretty good shape. You can actually still read it. Uh, we also have a large poster collection. Uh, we have posters about exhibits, about um, events uh, around New Jersey, about um, uh, a lot of performing arts events. Uh, this, is a, this is a poster for the New Jersey Performing Arts uh, Prelude. This is actually before the Arts Center opened. This is from 1993. I guess this was a fundraiser to raise money for the Performing Arts Center. This was an event that we had a poster for. We have a large poster kept in our off-site storage. Uh, we also have a large map collection. Uh, this is one of our maps. This is one of our um, uh, city atlases. We have a number of fire insurance atlases that begin in 1868 and go through 1926. This is the 1926 atlas. The page is opened to downtown. Um, yeah, this is, this is the central market, so this is uh, Commerce Street here and Market Street there. Um, and then we have, um, we have another part of downtown there. These, these books, these atlases, have all been digitized, and they're available on our digital archive, digital.npl.org. Most, most of our Newark maps have been digitized and are available there. But we still have these beautiful books. Of, you know, People sometimes come in and they want to see the physical books, and we can bring them out and show them to people. Okay, so I just uh, I just wanted to show you that little video. Uh, that was for Anne Englot's class. Um, thank you, Tim. <laughs> I forgot to remember her last. She's a professor at Rutgers, and we uh, she teaches a class in Newark history. And she wanted to um, because of the pandemic, she wasn't able to take her students on field trips, which is what she usually does in that class. And she wants so she wanted to do a series of video tours, and we were the first video tour she always enjoyed the students always enjoyed their visit to the library so much she wanted to do a video tour of the library so i led them around and i did a little presentation on the new jersey room my colleague nadine sergeyev did a presentation on the special collections department uh and um it, we have a series of videos now that uh, were produced in february and that was just one of them so now we want to talk about the exhibit 
Um, so I just want to, uh, we have a little presentation that we're going to go through to show you some of the um, seven, we have 17 cases of the exhibit uh, focusing on different aspects of the work that we've done in the New Jersey room since October 1951 when we entered, and even actually a little bit before October of 1951 since we go into some earlier history. And so we're going to go through them, and my colleagues, uh, Beth and Greg and I, are going to talk about the different um, the different cases in the exhibit, uh, and we'll talk about why we chose what we chose and what collections we looked at, etc. So let me just open that presentation. Uh, just one moment. Back to this. Okay. Sorry. Just one minute. Okay, so let's start with the first panel, the first case, the overview of the collections. Uh, Beth Zach Cohen curated this case, and Beth, why don't you talk a little bit about why you chose what you chose in that case and um, what you were trying to say by, uh, by having this case. Well, the reason I suggested a case showing an overview was because, as you could see in the video, we have so many different types of things, genres of things. And a lot of people don't know everything that's in there. There's some collections that aren't cataloged as well that people may not know about, even regulars who come in all the time. So I thought we should try to represent everything that we have. So we did uh, represent some of the well-known collections like the photos. Here's a photo of, that's one of the broader market photos that Tom showed in the video. Uh, and the newspaper collections are represented because that's of course a big, a big thing that people always use. But I also wanted to highlight uh, government documents, which isn't used as much. If you don't know, we have uh, a, a wide range of city documents and state documents. So I had found, uh, which was very fun, a 1962 proposal to put a botanical garden right behind uh, New York Public Library. So I thought that was a fun example of a government document. And there's other things like uh, periodicals. Just the other day, we had a researcher uh, researching Italians, and we found some periodicals that uh, they didn't know about. She said, well, how did you find these? You know, where, where, where did they come from? So there's all these different th things in the New Jersey room that people may not know about. And that's what I wanted to, to highlight in that case. Thank you, Beth. Um, in the lower right-hand corner of this panel here, uh, I want to draw your attention to Q1. Um, throughout the exhibit, we have a series of questions uh, and reference questions that we've received over the years. These are questions that have been gathered together by by Greg, uh, by he was going through old uh, monthly reports, and he found a bunch of questions, several questions that we answered in the days before you could Google answers to things like this. People would call libraries, and these were questions we answered, and we had we reproduced the questions here and ask you to take a stab at them while you're looking at the ca uh, the cases. And at the end of the exhibit, we have a big panel with all the answers to these questions. So this is just the first of the 17 questions we have in the exhibit. Is there a statue of Alexander Hamilton in New Jersey? Unfortunately, we will not be providing the answers tonight. <laughs> we have to visit the library and look at the exhibit and find out the answers. Anyway, our second panel was what I called beginnings. It was a panel that I did. I wanted to uh, do a little bit about the history of the New Jersey Room and the beginning of the um, of why the New Jersey Room was established in the early days of the New Jersey Room. Um, we have been, um, you know, the New, the New York Public Library has been in existence since 1889, and we have been collecting material about New Jersey, of course, since the library was established. But it wasn't until the 1920s that there was a distinct collection form. They called the New Jersey Collection. It was managed by a librarian who also had other duties, uh, and there were some historical people who also worked with that librarian, um, but it wasn't until 1951 that it was actually set aside as a separate department, its own reading room, its own dedicated staff, and um, so it was, I, I, you know, and I, this, basically, this case uh, has uh, various items in it that trace that history and the, the beginning of the New Jersey collection and the New Jersey 
in the New Jersey room in 1951. Uh, we include, and included among the items is this picture of Julia Sabine on the right. Uh, Julia Sabine was later known uh, much better as an art librarian at the Newark Public Library, but from 1935 to 1943, she was the librarian in charge of the New Jersey collection. And this photo is from about 1940 uh, when she was running the New Jersey room and I just, or the New Jersey collection. Uh, and I just wanted to, and I just have a number of items about that, about the, his, the early history of the New Jersey collection. Uh, oops, just a minute. Okay, so the next case was on Miriam Studley. And so now we go back to Beth to talk about that. So uh, not all of you may know that Miriam Studley was the next head of the New Jersey room. Uh, the room's named after Charles Cummings. So I know as soon as we started this, exhibit, <laughs> Tom said, I know you're gonna wanna do the case on Miriam Studley. And I said, uh, yes, because I, I like women's history and I wanted to highlight uh, Miriam Studley because uh, everyone knows Charles Cummings, but no one knows that Miriam Studley was actually the person who, who began the New Jersey room as a room. So Julia Sab Sabine was in charge and then she went off, I believe, to library school, extra schooling. And Miriam Studley took over the New Jersey collection and then when it became a New Jersey room in 1951. And uh, she was born in China to missionary. She went to Vassar College and she came to the library as a children's librarian. And then she eventually, I believe it was the bicentennial. So she got involved in that and she started being interested in history. And so that's how she became part of the New Jersey room. So I found some interesting things, even for <laughs> those of you who may already know who Mir Miriam Studley is. I found out that she was part of the Interstate Hiking Club and she would write these articles for the Patterson Morning Call about all their hikes. They would take long column articles. Um, as everyone, or a lot of people may know, she wrote also when Newark was younger columns for the Sunday Call. So we included one of those, basically similar to how Charles Cummings wrote articles for the Star Ledger in, in later years. And some, some photos of her throughout the years as well as some of the books she contributed to throughout her life were, were also included uh, at the Historical Society in her retirement. She helped with the Stevens papers and she wrote a guide to those. And she had also edited another anthology about travel in New Jersey. So those were some of the items that we used in that case. But I really wanted to highlight uh, Miriam Studley as an important person in the history of the New Jersey room, even though it's not named after her, but <laughs> Thank you, Beth. So I did the case on Charles F. Cummings. Uh, Charles Cummings uh, replaced uh, Miriam Studley as the head of the room in 1966 when Miriam Studley retired. And he ran it um, for most of the next 40 years until his death in 2005. He was a bit of a local institution in Newark. He was uh, named official city historian in 1988. Uh, he was a he was a, a co-founder of the Newark History Society. He was a much loved figure around the city and, and around New Jersey. Whenever I go um, anywhere, I tell people where I work, they always ask me if I knew Charles. And I have to say that no, unfortunately I didn't. I didn't begin work in the department until about five years after Charles died. But we have a case of um, items about Charles. We have some pictures of him. We have some news articles about him. We have the article when he from the Star Ledger when he was named the city historian. Uh, we have an article about um, a salute written by Philip Roth from right after he died. And we have a few other items. There's, we have a lot about Charles in our collection. He left his personal papers to the library. So we have that collection. We have a lot of photos of him in the picture collection. We have articles about him in at the IF, the information file. Uh, and we have many other items about him. He's a very uh, prominent presence in our collection. So that is Charles, that is the case in Charles Cummings. The next we move on from the actual room itself into some of the um, items that uh, the, the, the different subject areas that we cover in the collection. Um, uh, we have a large um, we have a large collection of materials about African Americans, and for this, I focused on some of the recent acquisitions we've made. We've always collected um, material about African Americans in Newark and New Jersey. But, it's, but in the last few years, our collections in this area have increased dramatically by um, different acquisitions we've um, made, different donations that people have made. Uh, the Tiny Prince collection, which came to us in 2015 after Tiny Prince died, is a collection of material from, uh, he was a journalist and a publisher. Uh, he published uh, many um, magazines uh, and art uh, and, um, 
he, he published several publications that, that documented the um, lives of African-Americans in Newark and nearby towns. We um, uh, acquired his um, archive after his death in 2015. We also have the archive of um, Bob, of Robert Curvin, who died in 2014. He was an activist and uh, um, a professor and um, he, his materials, he was a um, civil rights uh, activist in the 60s. Uh, many of items from his um, collection are also, in our, are also now, or from his um, archive are also in now our collect in our collection now. Uh, the Junius Williams collection, which we acquired about three years ago uh, and is still being processed. Uh, Junius Williams is a lawyer and activist and historian. He is now, he's the current city historian. Uh, he, there's his collection. And then we also have the collection, the collection of materials from Barbara J. Kukla, who was a Star Ledger reporter and editor for about 40 years and is a collector of um, material about African Americans in Newark and New Jersey, particularly in Newark. And we have her collection um, and we have her archive in our collection as well. So that was the African Americans case. So now next is Latinx communities. And now uh, Greg will talk about that. That is the case that Greg worked on. Greg? Thank you, Tom. Um, I want to thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Welcome. Um, in working on, the, um, on our collections in regard to the Latinx community, um, I had to respect the fact that we have an amazing uh, department in the library called the New Jersey Hispanic Reference um, and Information Center <clears throat> that is the go-to place for anything connected with the Hispanic community. Um, we do have some materials, especially photographs uh, documenting some of the uh, early celebrations of culture and tradition uh, in Newark and elsewhere in New Jersey. Also some interesting items such as a, a telephone directory specifically for the Latina community in New Jersey and it covered um, businesses from all the way from Hudson County down to Atlantic City. Um, I, in, in view and part of the fact that, you know, the Hispanic Research and Information Center does the bulk of our collecting for the Spanish language and Spanish culture communities, um, I thought it would be a good idea to broaden the definition of Latinx uh, so that it included not only those whose heritage is tied to countries that were former Spanish colonies in the Americas, but also those countries uh, such as Brazil and Haiti uh, that were former colonies of Portugal and France. So um, in the the bulk of uh, what we have in this case uh, does cover uh, Puerto Rican, Dominican, and Cuban communities in New Jersey. Um, there are some fascinating images, one in particular of young uh, Cuban Americans in Union City celebrating the overthrow of Fulgencio Batista in 1959 and the triumph of the Cuban Revolution and uh, Fidel Castro. Um, and uh, this is connected, I think, to the next case as well, which is on immigrant groups and that we do see, um, we do, do see issues uh, that immigrants and other communities face, um, including um, the challenges to their, to their very presence in the country, uh, challenges to their rights as workers. And so these two cases really do help a little bit to document some of the stories of resilience, but also resistance um, among these groups in our community. Um, within the uh, immigrant groups case, I uh, found that there was a thread connecting several different groups and that was sports, uh, a way of preserving ties with the former homeland, but also a way of adapting, or if you like assimilating to the, to the new reality of America. Uh, and one of my interesting finds uh, was that in the early 1960s, we had a significant community of Guyanese immigrants uh, who had a cultural association established in East Orange. And there was a Guyanese cricket club, uh, which competed not only locally, but nationally and even across the border in Canada. 
Um, so um, so this, uh, th these two cases, I think, document uh, many, many, many facets of life in New Jersey uh, and in Newark for those who are newcomers. Um, and I will just say uh, in concluding this portion that it is a challenge to collect um, on uh, immigrant, immigrant groups, uh, partly because of issues of trust, um, partly because of issues of sensitivity on the sides of libraries. And it, it really is worth it for libraries such as ours to make an extra effort to try uh, to build bridges with the new groups, especially those uh, newcomers from Africa and Asia for whom we have very little in our collections. And we don't want that to continue. It's really worth uh, trying to expand our reach and also make those communities feel that, um, that we can be a home for them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so now, uh, Beth, you did the case on Jewish materials. Yes, so um, I wanted to highlight some of our materials. There's a lot of collections that may touch on, on Jewish issues, but uh, one of our largest collections and most famous families in Newark is uh, the Sam Berg collection. Uh, his brother, Mo Berg, as many may know, it was a Yankee pitcher and World War II spy. And we have, I think, 20 plus boxes of his materials. He was a doctor, Dr. Sam Berg. So I definitely wanted to include that collection. And then some of our photos, for example, this one of Benai Jesarun Synagogue. Uh, we also have some photos of Prince Street and the Jewish community there. And then we have some um, interesting smaller publications as well that may have not been widely printed on history of the Jews. There's one that has like little charts um, to say, you know, where people are employed. They did a survey of all the Jews in the community. And there's another one just called the Essex story, the story of uh, Jews in the community. So they're both weren't widely printed and they give a really nice complete history of the Jewish community in Newark. And then the last collection I highlighted was just a small family collection. I kind of wanted to, to give the point that we have a lot of family collections that, that may give more information. Uh, this was a recent collection that we got from the Berman family. And what they had in there was Valentine's and wedding invitation and letters from the boyfriend to the girlfriend, you know, before they got married in 1934. So I just thought that was a cute collection uh, to include. Uh, it shows, you know, Jewish life, um, more of a fun side of uh, life in Newark uh, in the Jewish community in the 1930s. Thank you, Beth. So I did the case on LGBTQ plus materials. Uh, this is, um, we, uh, we didn't really have much on this community until sometime in the 1990s, uh, as, as, as it says in the introduction to the case here, uh, the LGBTQ plus community long invisible in much of American society was not represented until recently in the New Jersey Rooms collections. Uh, we have a collection of materials related to a uh, group that and uh, a, an AIDS uh, service group that was in existence in the late 80s and early 90s. That was one of the first groups that had explicit LGBTQ material. In it. Uh, we also have um, we have a few books, uh, and I, I focus on I have one of the books in the um, in the case. Uh, we have a magazine called Out in Jersey, which uh, is uh, the only real magazine that covers uh, statewide issues for the LGBTQ community. Uh, we have that um, magazine in our collection. We have some flyers, uh, such as this one from a group that was in existence at Rutgers Newark in the 80s. Uh, called Lesbians and Gays of Rutgers Newark. It was about um, advertising some meetings that took place. Uh, and um, I was actually surprised that I found enough to fill a case. I, was, I, was, I thought we might not have enough, but we actually had quite a bit. And, um, but it's all very recent stuff. We have only really been collecting this material since about the 90s. Okay, and now our next case was on community organizations and back to Beth. So there was a ton that we have, I feel like, on community corporations. Uh, some of it has been digitized in our digital collections at digital.mpl.org. We have a material, on, a collection on the Iron Bank Community Corporation, the HUD Tenants Coalition, uh, the Business and Industrial Coordinating Council, the Tri-City People's Organization. Uh, we have several people that were part of the Urban League, William Ashby, 
uh, Harold Lett. So there was a lot to choose from. I did uh, use this photo from Kaiwita uh, Towers to show kind of protests and things that we have from that. Uh, also Gus Henningberg, I highlighted that collection. As you may know, Gus Henningberg was a big activist for a long time. And we have a lot of flyers, a lot of buttons. That's another thing that we tried to use in the, in the exhibit, you know, not just, not just images, uh, some objects. So in this collection, there were a lot of buttons and bumper stickers and things that we could use. Uh, we had a bumper sticker that said, save Kia's Ark. Uh, you may know about that, which was in the 80s. Uh, Kia Tawana built a big arc and there was a big controversy about, about that. Uh, so that, that was there. I think Charles Cummings was the one who collected that, that bumper sticker. And uh, one of the interesting collections we also have is on, uh, it's called the Veterans of Future Wars. So we have a whole collection on that. And it's this group from the 1930s at Princeton University who called themselves Veterans of Future Wars. And it was a satirical way of advocating for peace. Uh, they said that they should receive compensation for fighting in the future wars. And actually Beatrice Windsor here at the library was very involved with them. So we have all sorts of uh, interesting things that, that um, may not be well known today as well as some of the, the current um, organizations that are still organizing in Newark today. Okay, so the next case was on the 1967 rebellion. This is a subject, as I said in the video, that we get asked about probably more than any other. We have a lot of researchers coming in. We have a collection, uh, a lot of material on this. We have uh, two archival collections. We have a lot of material in the IF, a lot of photos, including this photo on the right that you see here. Um, and, uh, the case uh, basically um, this uh, has a, a several items, including a um, information about a uh, conference that took place in 1977, evaluating the um, state of the city 10 years after the rebellion. Uh, we also have some, several of the items that are in this case have also been digitized. And this is definitely something you would uh, want to take a look at when you come in to see the exhibit. So the next case is on what we call the RAI collection. And Greg is going to talk about that. All right, this is certainly uh, a different um, aspect of the exhibit from the others. Um, some of you who have been who have worked with the Newark Public Library catalog online, and even some members of staff have probably been puzzled when they've looked up a title and found that there was a copy in the NJRAI. Uh, and in fact, uh, those of us in the New Jersey room in fact, weren't completely sure until we began preparing this exhibit, what is RAI? Uh, and it turns out NJRAI, which is the full abbreviation, stands for New Jersey Reference Authors and Imprints. Uh, in contrast with the other cases uh, where we you know, made a conscious effort to try and tell a story or some stories, uh, I felt at, at liberty in arranging this case to be to use the complete random method of selection because we have an entire wall of RAI uh, books that were printed or that were written uh, in New Jersey, uh, authored by New Jersey authors. Uh, and then that wall also encompasses a large fiction collection. Um, I'm not altogether sure what the history of this collection is. I suspect that probably it uh, developed under the influence of John Cotton Dana, although he probably didn't have much of a hand in it, but because of his interest in the history of the book and printing worldwide, and our rare books collection is um, exemplifies that quite a bit. Um, I think probably that someone in the history of the New Jersey room or even the New Jersey collection before the room was founded, uh, thought that it was worthwhile to, to start a collection of New Jersey imprints or books by New Jersey authors. So in this, in this case, you'll see uh, examples of uh, thrillers, novels, poetry, biography. Uh, there's a book of football fundamentals by John Bateman, who was uh, a great uh, football coach at Rutgers. Um, 
you won't probably need to ask us to get one of these books out of the case for you because there are generally copies of these elsewhere in the collection. But the RAI collection does include some very early imprints, um, mainly Newark, but some in other towns uh, from the early 19th century and even before. Um, so next time you're visiting the, uh, the online catalog at npl.org, um, if you hit upon something that's in the RAI, now you'll know what that's about. Okay. So let's stay with Greg for, to talk about genealogy, another popular topic in our, uh, uh, in our collection. Uh, definitely. Uh, people who are researching their families, either starting out trying to construct a family tree or, or just fine tuning it, uh, have frequent recourse to the New Jersey room because of our resources. Uh, and so in this case, I tried to uh, show some of the many resources that we use to assist people with these questions, um, but also to give a little bit of um, an, an explanation of how these sources work and, and why they exist. So some of these were already mentioned by Tom in the, in the video. Um, of course, we have old newspapers, most of which are on microfilm, and those are very useful resources for finding uh, death notices and obituaries. We have access through our library subscription to Ancestry to uh, census records and other uh, records. And then the city directories, as Tom also mentioned. Um, many people don't know that the city directories, how the city directories came to be. They were really for business owners, for merchants. Uh, to be able to locate potential customers, um, either business customers or uh, households uh, that they might be able to do business with. And this is way before the era of the telephone and certainly before any subsequent technologies. Uh, in the genealogy case, I also tried to show some, uh, some visual resources such as maps um, and um, you have an, uh, an image here which uh, interestingly is a wedding photo that's uh, somehow found its way into our, uh, into our photo files. Uh, Otto and Helena or Helen Jaeger, who were both immigrants from Germany. Um, and the case does um, show how they're, you know, we can find out more about them by looking at the census, by looking at um, marriage records and so on. And, um, the, the census of 1900 showed that having, ma having married in 1898, uh, they produced a child, Otto Jr., I guess, um, and he is recorded in the census in the year 1900 as 11 months old. Okay, thank you. So the next case is on current collecting in the digital archive, and Beth is going to talk about that. So we wanted to emphasize that we are still collecting things. Uh, we wish we could do more, like, like Greg said, it would be great if we, could, we had the time to, to do even more, but we are collecting things as they come in. So in the past year, we've collected on coronavirus, on elections, the water, the water crisis that recently happened in Newark. We collect flyers, handouts, a lot of that sort of thing uh, commonly. Uh, another thing that we've been doing recently is web archiving. So we've been collecting websites and social media. So you can see in this image here, uh, we did a search for Newark protests during the Black Lives Matter protest and archived the Instagram feed, which gave a lot of great photos and videos of that protest, uh, which was very historical and will be great to have saved for, for history. And then we've also digitized, of course, a lot of material on digital.mpl.org. So if you haven't gone there, you can check that out. We also have two photo frames in the exhibit that show some of the material from the digital collection as well. So we wanted to highlight in this case, all the things we're, we're still collecting and uh, some of the stuff that we've done in the online realm. Okay, great. And so now Beth will also talk about some of our long-term employees, which is the last case we're going to talk about tonight. So I had a fun time doing this case. I liked learning about all the employees that we had in the past. Uh, I have the list here. I just want to shout them out real quick. Miriam Ball was also uh, a founder of the room. 
Uh, she did a lot of the indexing. There's the ball index to, I think, is it our photos? Um, Gertrude Callahan worked there for many years as well. Callan, excuse me. Uh, and then some of the other librarians who worked there for many years, George Hawley, who's in this picture, James Osborne, also in this picture, uh, Karen Gilbert and Bob Blackwell who for many years would come back and volunteer every six months, even though he was in his 80s and 90s. And then some of our assistants, uh, library assistants, Savella Copeland was an assistant at the start of the room in 1951 and she retired in 2012. So uh, almost 60 years, uh, Valerie Austin, Willis Taylor and Ralph Tolan. So we have a lot of people in the history of the Dinger's room who have worked there for 20 years or more. That's kind of the what we the criteria we used to include, and as you can see, we got a lot of people. There was no need to add more. Uh, the only one who didn't make the 20 years was Miriam Ball. Unfortunately, she she died uh, soon after the opening of Ginger's Room in 1958. And I also looked for quotes about each staff member. So for a lot of the staff members, I was able to find uh, some great things that the supervisors or the public had said about them to kind of emphasize you know, they were a great uh, addition to the staff of Ginger's Room. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Greg. So, uh, do we have any questions? Um, uh, no, I see one question that was sent to me directly, but I'm going to answer it publicly. So, <laughs> Gail Malmgreen um, asked about uh, the material in the Black Conference, uh, Black Power Conference, come from. I believe that's in an archival collection, um, uh, and I, but I don't think it's called that. I think it's in the Newark African Americans collection, Gail. Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah, and it's um, and the, she all, you also asked about the Rutgers Newark LGBTQ flyer um, that came from uh, I think the Newark Broadsides collection. That's uh, one of the items there, and that's been digitized. That's available on the digital archive. Uh, yeah, oh, so, oh, oh, so this is a great question. Story. This is a great question from from Bob, Bob Vitragoski. Hi, Bob. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, we, the access to the exhibit now, it is available anytime the library is open and our hours now are, well, they're going to be expanding on June 7th. We will be open nine to five, uh, and only closing for an hour at lunchtime from 12 to one beginning June 7th. Um, many of you probably know that we have been on a, um, a schedule since September where we've been open a few hours and closed a few hours, open an hour, closed an hour. That's going to mostly end on June 7th. We will be open from nine to five, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, just closing for an hour at lunch from 12 to one. On Wednesday, we'll be open from 12 to eight, closing for an hour um, from three to four. And then on Saturdays, we'll be open from 10 to two and we will not be closing at all on Saturdays. So we are open six days a week. We're open six days a week now, but we'll be open even more hours, six days a week beginning on June 7th. And the uh, exhibit can be viewed anytime we're open and it will be up until March 31st of next year. Uh, and so, okay. Oh, okay, somebody's, uh, Ar um, Arnold is asking, can you speak about any authors who have used your resources to write their books? Yes, several local books. Uh, I mentioned Robert Curvin at one point, he used to ask in his uh, research for his book. Um, I believe Mark Krasovic is here tonight. He used, he did some research in our facility to, um, uh, for a book he wrote a few years ago. And I think Greg actually has a better list than I, <laughs> yeah, and he, thank you, Mark. And then I think Greg has even more information about this because he actually did the research and finding quotes about us from around. So uh, Greg, you might even be able to list a few more people. Right, and not, I don't have them right on the tip of my tongue, but um, uh, John Cunningham, a, a late uh, well-known popular author on New Jersey history. Um, Philip Roth, of course, uh, made extensive use of our collections in research for his novel. Uh, you mentioned Bob Curvin, Mark Krasovic, uh, Guy Sterling, um, and uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting many. Um, we, uh, we were thanked in so many, in the prefaces or in the acknowledgements pages of so many books. Um, and I was you know, trying to collect the quote, quotes that actually uh, had a little bit more content to them than just thank you. Um, but I know that those thank yous were, were all heartfelt. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, many people, including many people who are here this evening, um, uh, really do appreciate the uniqueness of our collection and of the services that we provide. And that's a tradition now 70 years old and counting. 
Okay. And um, also we want to remember Warren Grover, whose book, Nazis in New York. He did a lot of research in our room for that book. Um, and some other uh, names have been, I have some other names have been listed in the chat room. Grayson Danzig in his book of photographs of Billie Holiday performing in Newark. Uh, Gordon Bond and his 1953 Woodbridge train wreck. Um, I think he may have done some research. For this. Um, now we do have a question here. Do you have access to any Rutgers Newark's grad or undergrad historical archives? Or do they keep any? Uh, we have some material about um, Rutgers Newark in our collection and also Rutgers Newark's predecessor, the University of Newark. We have some information about that. I know we have one researcher who's very interested in the history of Rutgers Newark and the University of Newark and he's been in to look at some materials that um, you know we kind of found just through a search of uh, uh, the archives and we were really surprised at actually what we had. He was surprised too. I'm looking at a lot of the uh, Newark Evening News photos recently and they're filled with um, Photos of Rutgers students, photos of University of Newark students. You know, it was a, stu it was a University of Newark was a school in the 30s and 40s, predecessor of Rutgers Newark. Um, yeah, we we do have a um, we do have some material about that. Um, we don't have a formal Rutgers Newark collection, formal Rutgers Newark archive, but there's material in our collection about Rutgers Newark. Yes. Oh, and uh, Gino and also uh, Bob Vitrugoski is uh, reminding us that yes, there is a new, uh, there is a new Rutgers, um, a new Rutgers Newark archives at Dana Library at, at Rutgers Newark, uh, and Angela Lawrence is the uh, archivist in charge of that collection. So that's good to know too. We do actually have a very small archive called the Rutgers University collection. Oh, do, oh, do um, we both, really? It includes yeah. both Newark and New Brunswick, I think. Just, yeah, that's, just, in the, that's, that's a New Jersey collection, items. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, if uh, you know Beth or Greg, if you see any other question you think we should answer, um, mm -hmm. oh, uh, when will you be adding the to the Newark Evening News online? Um, we've digitized about the first forty years of the Newark Evening News. We've had trouble getting it online. Um, uh, we hope to digitize a few more years soon, and we hope to um, resolve this problem that we've had about getting it online. So we hope that um, we, we can't give you a date yet, uh, but we hope soon, <clears throat> within the next year or two, we hope, um, to have it available online until about 1925. Paper started publishing in 1883, so you know, for about 42 years. That's what we're aiming toward, at least. And Don just asked about indexing. All the indexing is in these big handwritten <laughs> books. So for that to get online, we, we do have the, the index to the morgue online. It's on our main website on npl.org. So you can see all the files that we have at the library. Um, but those handwritten indexes it would, would be a big project to scan. That one would probably <laughs> wouldn't be possible. <laughs> And we'd rather we'd act we'd actually rather scan the newspaper itself so that the newspaper is searchable. Um, as for the question about um, somebody's asking, any chance the library will host in-person walking tours based on some of your collections? We are uh, crossing our fingers and we are hoping that we will be able to go back to more in-person activities in the fall. We'd like to do an in-person program related to this exhibit in October, which is the actual anniversary of when the room opened. The room opened on October 15th, 1951. We'd like to maybe bring back some former employees and do maybe a little panel discussion in October. And we would like, we are hoping that we can return to in-person tours. We haven't, we haven't been able to do them yet, but we hope that hope by the fall but that no no announcement has been made you know that's up to you know that's up to admin, the administration and so we're, we're waiting to hear about that but we are hoping that that happens before the end of the year. Gaetano asked a question about there being an archive of jazz in Newark and um, I would think that the Barbara Kukla papers would be a good place to start there there's of course also the Institute for Jazz Studies at Rutgers Newark, but it's not Newark specific or even Newark focused. It's more national and world focused in its collecting. Um, but those are two resources that I can think of. Maybe you can think of others. Uh, I was just gonna say, uh, Carol said more than one of us can contribute. We would love people to contribute. You know, We're always taking donations. We didn't 
get to the case. We have a case on some of our donors, but uh, it says in that case that if anyone wants to contribute anything from Newark history, we are happy to, to have it. We'd love to talk to you. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, yeah, Barbara Kukla, uh, since she did the book Swing City on jazz, does have a lot, a lot of jazz history. Uh, we have a lot of images. Uh, Al Henderson took some images of musicians mm -hmm. and things. Uh, he, we have his collection, which is portraits of African Americans. He was a photographer for a long time. So we have a, a few, a few things. And then there's also the African American newspapers, um, some of which we've digitized. And there was a little discussion in the chat about the uh, Jewish news uh, that we have not we have not indexed that, and we don't have it searchable. But it has been it has been digitized by the Jewish Historical Society of New Jersey, and the um, the database is available free of charge on their website if you want to search the Jewish news. If you're looking for obituaries from the Jewish news, etc., um, you can also look and you can also contact us to look in the Newark papers uh, for any um, for obituaries as well. Oh, and Beth provided the uh, the link to the uh, <laughs> the Jewish news. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, just type them in the chat box, and hopefully, hopefully, we didn't miss any. I, I've been going through; I don't see any. Oh, that'd be great, Bill. Yeah, we'd love to talk to you about that. So a collection we didn't mention for jazz, I guess, is Tiny Prince. Uh, he gave us oh, all yes, those yeah, photos of, of course, yeah. nightlife, and uh, many of them are not identified. So it would be great if anyone who knows the people in those photos, a lot of them are on the website. So you know, you could even look at them on the website and see if you know anyone and uh, send it to us and we could mark it down. Somebody did that recently. There was the ABC director, Johnny, Johnny Pearsons, maybe. So I, I put his name in, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, anyone else, anyone else with any questions? Um, special collections for the history of urban renewal. We have a lot of art, we have a lot of articles in our information file. In fact, we have folder upon folder of urban renewal um, articles. Um, I believe that there would, I, yeah, I'm sure we've been looking in the archives, but we, I'd have to do a search. Um, we have I some maps um, in, the, yeah. in the government yeah. documents. Specifically, yeah. we have a lot yeah. of documents in the Central Planning Board, which all have been scanned, uh, urban renewal maps, urban renewal reports. And another one that recently came in was the Housing Authority photographs, uh, which was photos of the project areas. And they all have like urban renewal codes on them. Like they were urban renewal number 42 or something. I don't know, that's not how it, how it is, but something like that. Um, so you can see exactly what areas were gonna be um, part of urban renewal. So that's really interesting too. And a lot of the projects are in there as well, the housing projects. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great, great. All right, well, um, thank you for joining us here tonight. And thank you, Beth and Greg, for all the work you did on the exhibit. It was a lot of fun working together on this. Uh, this is the first time we've been, um, the first time the three of us have co-curated a uh, an exhibit, uh, and it was um, it was a lot of fun. And thank you very much. Um, oh, also, Gail Mongren is um, back to the urban renewal question. She's reminding us about the Ernie, Ernest papers, uh, which is a some of those are on our digital collection, collection as well in, yeah. our, in our collection as well. And uh, but thank you very much. Um, have a good night, everyone. Be safe. Thank you.